record this conversation. So make sure we'll, we'll send it out uh, so you can view it or pass it to your colleagues or whatever else. But uh, again, uh, everyone that's jumping on the call, thank you for joining us. We're really excited um, to have our folks, or our friends at, uh, from Blue Shift. And of course, uh, we're on the, the meta router side. We're excited to have Andrew and, and kind of join in on this conversation on our side. So um, again, this conversation will be recorded. Uh, we'll chat for about you know, 35 minutes or so, and then um, we will take questions along the way. Um, and if for some reason we can't quite address them uh, while we're chatting, we'll make sure to come back to those questions. So feel free to chat them to us. Um, you can either chat them to the panelists or, or to the group as, as a question, and, and we'll make sure we address them either during the chat or, or after. So um, so one, one great thing about this series, it's supposed to be very casual, right? So we, we like to have a conversation uh, and kind of bring some of the internal conversations we have not only amongst our colleagues at MetaRouter, but with our partners, right? So we like to kind of expose our, our brain power to a broader audience to let them know uh, or, or, or kind of contribute in the conversation around what we're thinking and how we think and how we think. And today we're talking specifically about compliance um, and how that affects marketing professionals. We all have heard of GDPR and CCPA and HIPAA and lots of other guidelines and, and compliance standards that are coming down the pipeline. Um, so that in itself requires an amount of brain power that can be tough to juggle, especially when marketers are focused on personalization and they're focused on where their data uh, is going when and, and optimization and designs. There's a whole broad scope of what marketing cares about. Um, but even more importantly now, data infrastructure um, around that marketing needs to be very careful around this compliance that's becoming more important, as it should, right? There's privacy and compliance that plays a big role um, in our customers' lives and in our, our privacy online. So um, a few of the takeaways, just before we, we do kind of introductions of who we have the call, a couple of takeaways I'm hoping you guys get on the call. Um, what are the right marketing tools necessary to help you handle compliance? So what do you need to start thinking about in terms of uh, you know, tools and, and what powers your own marketing stack uh, and, and how does that affect uh, how you handle compliance. The other, um, you know, let, we'll talk a little bit about what, what challenges the third party tools create for companies. So um, just getting an understanding, I know we, we work with third party vendors all the time and everyone handles data a little differently. Uh, so we'll talk about those challenges and what you need to think about relative to CCPA and GDPR and, and HIPAA. Um, and third-party cookie changes coming down the pipe too. Uh, a few other um, takeaways, solutions we've discovered uh, both together and separately on how we help navigate these waters. And then uh, also some tangible steps that you as compliant-driven marker, marketers can take away now. So, um, you know, we hope you can walk away with some real action steps and really get a get an understanding for, um, you know, what are some things you can be doing now. So without further ado, um, I'd like to kind of introduce the other folks on the call. Calvin, we'll start with you since you're our guest. Calvin Selwood is from uh, Blue Shift. I'll let you talk a little bit about yourself, your role, and, and of course, what uh, Blue Shift does. Yeah, thanks. And I guess I, I'll start off by saying thanks so much for having me, Dave and Andrew. Really excited to be here. Uh, so guys, on the call, my name is Calvin Selwood, and I'm a product marketing manager here at Blue Shift. Little background on BlueShift, we are a smart hub CDP, customer data platform. And really what, the, what we do is we connect all your first party data, um, all your first party applications and tools and build a deep customer understanding and help marketers direct interactions in real time. And BlueShift really helps marketers and in heavily regulated industries become self-sufficient with the ability to deliver relevant and consistent connected experiences throughout the omni-channel journey. Awesome, thank you, Dan. And thank you guys for Blue Shift for, for joining us today. So it's great to have you. Yeah, uh, Andrew, Mr. Mr. Murray, let's uh, maybe a quick background of yourself and then you can talk about MetaRouter real quick if you like, just to make sure people understand what we do. <laughs> sure, um, I'm Andrew Murray, I'm the CTO and uh, lead architect for the enterprise platform for MetaRouter. Uh, MetaRouter, we've positioned ourselves as a data syndication platform. So we specialize in high security, on-prem, private uh, platforms that help syndicate analytical data uh, from your various applications to uh, partners that help drive insights of that data. Awesome. And I, I understand there's a hidden door behind that picture on your right. There is. 
pretty sweet. But it's secret, so we can't talk about it. We don't have to talk about that. <laughs> um, cool. Well, well, again, thank you guys. I appreciate it. So let's dive in a little bit. Let's let's talk about um, why we're here, right? So, you know, with all these regulations coming that that are here, honestly, I keep saying they're coming, but there's more, right? Changes to third party uh, tracking and, and cookies and all that stuff. It's truly um, kind of the wild west right now. Um, so it's important not only from an education standpoint to stay on top of it, but also from a tool standpoint to understand how your marketing stack is handling that. Um, so, so Callan, first question to you, what, why, why does marketing require the right stack? I mean, there are so many third party tools out there that are, are, you know, keeping track of how our customers engage and where they engage. Like what, why does this matter right now? Yeah, no, great question. So I guess maybe we'll, kind of take a step back and talk about the current state or the historical state of what companies uh, have typically been going through and then kind of what's coming in the future or what should be on people's minds. Sure. So historically or typically speaking, most of these brands, they're going to use a variety of different applications, whether they're downstream applications or upstream um, tools, whatever they may, whatever they may be. But typically these, these applications result in really only mass messaging consumers uh, in one direction. And it's, it's not really personalized. These applications are, they're really siloed. None of them are talking to them, which results in kind of disconnected actual views of your customers. I would say also historically speaking um, for these kind of, for, for these specific heavily regulated industries, these tools, are really like there's only one team managing these tools. So you'll have a, a team focused on email, a team focused on paid media or retargeting, a team focused on mobile. And a lot of these different teams, yes, they communicate, but their their priorities are going to take kind of the, the higher, I guess their projects are going to take the higher priority. Yeah. And it's not as connected as it should be, right? And marketers really like to drive these personalized, unique experiences that adapt to each user based on where they are in the customer life cycle. They really need tools that are omnidirectional, can take in and ingest data in real time and be able to trigger meaningful messages across, across channels that customers actually want to receive these communications on. And to actually get to this point, it's not an easy task. Um, especially if you want to make sure your data is secure, your data is safe, um, and you're actually using it properly, it's in the right hand. So it's a, it's a, it's a tough thing to do and it doesn't come overnight. Um, so like kind of with a, with a partner like MetaRouter, we're really able, I guess brands are really able to pipe in data from a variety of applications. They can do this securely. Um, whether it's from like a custom built CRM, maybe it's a call center, maybe it's some BI tool that they're using, but really able to unify all this data um, and help marketers deliver very personalized communications um, and act upon the insights that they're actually getting. And I would say it's on top of these kind of heavily regulated industries, it's, it's hard for marketers to find the right balance because you do want to engage customers with relevant personalized communications but you also kind of want to be respectful and cautious of what you're actually sending them, right? Like you don't want to overstep your boundaries. So it is a fine line that these marketers need to balance. Um, and then kind of, of course, obviously on top of all of like the, these privacy regulations, you also want to make sure your tools are, are being compliant with these kind of major, major private or major policies going around, like you just mentioned, GDPR, PII, GDP, uh, SOC 2, uh, HIPAA, whatever it may be. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, even from a, as a marketer myself, one thing that um, comes into play, especially, especially in those, you know, the heavily regulated kind of industries is it doesn't, um, your marketing uh, optically from, from a, either a user or, or a customer perspective, if, if you're overly intrusive with your marketing tactics, it certainly probably doesn't bode well for their feeling about how you handle their data. Right. Yep. So if, if you're, you, you know, you're sending them something totally irrelevant um, on a regular basis, clearly they, they optically from their point of view kind of says to them, man, they're not really thinking about how they're using my own data or my own interests. Right. Yep. And so I think tools like Blue Shift certainly, um, you know, certainly help kind of handle that. But, 
you know, so let's talk a little bit more about why there, there's kind of such a problem. So, so Andrew, kind of throwing to you, can you explain a little bit, like, why, why are third-party tools so problematic for, for marketers? Like, why, why is it, why is it, I mean, I think we know a little bit, but, you know, technically, why is it such a challenge to, to kind of handle this? Well, I mean, it's it's all around the the data gathering aspect of it. Um, you know, in order to really have a big boost to the into the insights that you can lock in this data, the data has to be collected. Uh, and normally, how that happens is, you know, you invite that third party onto your applications, you know, your mobile apps, your websites, uh, even some you know server based contexts. Uh, and you know you install the snippet, but that kind of gives them control over what's getting collected. They have full insight into, you know, the user browser sessions um, and the IDs that are associated with that. Um, and you know, it's really hard to be the responsible party uh, that is, you know, that has to enforce making sure that you have compliance towards HIPAA or you know the more journalist uh, consumer protections like GDPR, CCPA, and the other ones that we see coming uh, online, um, while also you know abstracting your control over you know what's getting collected. So you know normally that's that's where you know Meta Router is seeing whether the future of this is really going is towards you know really allowing you to gain control over that data collection part and understand what's flowing uh, and have full control over what your, your, your partners can. And you know, it definitely gives a lot of other benefits to that, but you know, it's abstracting that problem that you'll have with compliance because now you, you regain your full control and insight into exactly what data is being collected, what data is being sent out and you can you know, enforce those protections that, you know, are for the good of protecting the consumer. Right. Yep. That makes sense. I, I read actually, so this was pretty interesting. This is from emarketer.com. I was going to throw up a slide, but I think it's too disjointed just to kind of take away my beautiful face. But, um, you know, so, so the question was, why won't U.S. businesses be CCPA uh, compliant by January 1st, 2020? So obviously this is taken uh, late last year. 35% said it was too expensive to, to attain compliance. 32% was, was essentially waiting to see how it's enforced. So they're like, oh, we're aware, but we don't want to invest in one way, or we don't want to invest in one tool because we're not sure if it's even going to be enforced yet, which we know there's usually somewhat of a grace period. 17% um, said they don't think their business is large enough to face fines. 11% said they were totally unsure of the requirements and 5% said uh, they do not think it applies to their business, which is interesting. So obviously businesses themselves are handling this or, or taking the seriousness of this, uh, of this compliance in, in kind of a different way. Um, and I can certainly understand a cautious approach because you don't want to obviously spend too much money on, on the front end to become compliant and then um, and then not have any options, right, because of budget. But uh, yeah. clearly, it's interesting to see how companies are taking this. Um, uh, I'm going to say it, it's, it's very interesting to hear that you said that um, those smaller organizations say may, that I guess their business may not be regulated or whatnot. And like, regardless of your size, if you're big, mid, mid size or enterprise, all of these organizations need to comply with these privacy and regulations, right? It's just because you're a certain, maybe, maybe a bit smaller, you still need to make sure your data is secure, it's safe, it's being handled correctly, and actually going to the appropriate people who actually have access to it. Right. right. Yeah, totally. I mean, you're just, even at a small size, you're delaying the pain because like, let's yep. say <laughs> you see the success that you want to see, you become a bigger business, you become a bigger, you know, target for enforcement around these regulations. You're just delaying the inevitable. So it's, yeah. it's best to, and you know, it's best to find a pattern that works for you for your size, you know, to say that you have to handwrite everything. You have to take all your product resources and put it towards compliance. You know, that's not necessarily... Yep the way forward, you can use partnerships, these strategic partnerships to get there ahead of time before it's a big issue, before it's a giant legal headache for you. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. Spot on it. Spot hey, on. Uh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead, Calvin. <laughs> oh, I was gonna say, 
Yeah, I was gonna say like these smaller organizations that know it's on their it's on their radar and they know they should be doing something maybe I guess kind of gravitating towards that that may not have the the expertise or the resources. To your point, Andrew, look at third party tools to like kind of help with that. That's their core competency, right? These third party tools that's actually gonna pipe in this data and make sure it's secure. So uh, completely agree with you there. Quick question for you guys. Uh, just got my wheels spinning a little bit. What? Uh, who do you usually see this? Who kind of who cares about this most? Like, say say you're a medium sized business uh, on, a, on a decent sized marketing team. Uh, who who needs to care about compliance on the team? Is it usually one person? Is it a culture thing? Um, is it an enforced thing from the top down? Like, Calvin, do you see any do you see any commonalities, or is it all over the map? And and some yeah. don't care about it yet. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, it, it's definitely a, I would say a bit all over the map, but to, to your point, I would say creating a culture of compliance, right, is, is the new normal, right? Um, obviously, like these pol policy regulations have been out for a, for a while, but kind of ingraining this in your team, being compliant, being respectful of people's data, that's, that's necessity, right? That's what, that's what consumers are expecting nowadays as well. And yeah. it doesn't, like even, like yes, especially for heavily regulated industries, say it's healthcare, consumer finance, um, banking institution, that's, that's, that's one thing. But even on the e-commerce side, right? Like those, all of those types of, um, I guess, kind of less strict industries are, they're coming up just on the same path as well. And they're gonna have to follow these same regulations uh, in the coming years. Yeah, absolutely. The biggest advocate right now for organizations are the consumers. They're the ones that, you know, these protections yeah. are in, put in place. So, you know, the, the people that recognize that's you know, the consumer competency around, you know, information that's being collected about them and their privacy, those are the advocates that they end up having in the organization. It can be top down, it can be embedded within teams, but it's, mm -hmm. it's those that are realizing that consumer link and that success of their product is gaining that trust. Yep. Yeah, that's kind of fascinating, right? People are, people, there's a new level of education amongst, I think, our users and clients and customers. And um, it's, it's kind of interesting that uh, that's what's driving a lot of this, right? It, it's yeah. kind of, um, it's kind of inspiring and, and a lot of opportunity for organizations to get in front of it and handle it really well. And it's opportunity for, I think, companies to grow too. If, if you are uh, savvy in compliance, you're also likely a savvy marketer with with savvy personalization and next level yeah. personalization so kind of goes hand in hand which is pretty interesting so calvin um question to you like how does how does blue shift see this playing out with with clients i mean what are some use cases that you guys have kind of worked with your clients to help solve some of these challenges yeah great question so i guess kind of maybe taking a step back obviously kind of getting to that personalization at scale while also keeping data secure and compliant it's incredibly tough um it doesn't happen overnight there is a process and it involves lots of teams so kind of to to your last question dave um involving engineering and it resources every step of the way kind of during this evaluation process of new tools is, is critical, right? No one, um, especially on the marketing side, wants to go through so go through a rigorous evaluation process, select a tool, and then bring in their IT team to be like, hey, this doesn't integrate with our existing stack. Um, we, we have these certain demands or checklists that we need to hit. Yeah. And so just making sure all these teams are kind of aligned and it's actually gonna fit with your, with your existing stack. But in regards to, uh, how Blue Shift has has seen success, especially working with Meta Router. Um, I would say, kind of in a, a I would say a, a variety of different use cases. We have we've seen customers in the healthcare industry succeed quite quite a bit. So, for example, we have one um, one client who is in the healthcare industry, and their business is heavily driven by their call center. So when say a potential patient or potential prospect fills out a form and we'll just say it's for a insurance plan, right? That automatically triggers a, a call from a broker to actually follow up with that individual to really drive more engagement and ultimately get them to sign up for a certain plan. Sure. Prior to using Blue Shift and MetaRouter, 
uh, they had no way of integrating their, uh, their email provider, their ESP. They had an internal call center, an internal CRM or built in house that they built um, and no way of actually integrating that. So you guys can imagine how difficult it was to personalize a, a policy plan if they don't have a unified view of their customers. Right. That, can be, that can be pretty difficult to deliver tailored experiences when you only see one specific silo. Um, so leveraging kind of both of MetaRouter to pipe in data to BlueShift and allow marketers to be self-sufficient to deliver kind of unique, very personalized plans to these users um, is just kind of one great example of, hey, uh, here's all your first party data. You have access to kind of the what you need to, and now you can deliver very um, tailored, unique experiences. I would say another another interesting example, customer example, would be kind of in the consumer finance industry. So we know that this is another space where institutions struggle because it's a very dynamic catalog. Customers can, I guess, what they receive is very specific, right? Credit scores vary where they are in life, vary. Um, depending on their family size. So there's a, numerous variables that go into play to actually deliver personalized experiences. Right. Um, right, so one of our clients is a leading online marketplace for home mortgages and loans. And they really struggled to collect all of their first party data and act upon it to deliver relevant messages, whether it's, hey, this is your personalized home loan based on your credit score, based on your demographic area where you live in the United States, um, whatever it may be. Yep. And basically, the, the, their, their team has been able to unify all of their first party data across a variety of different systems. So whether it's their analytics tool, their website, their mobile application, really bring in, create single customer views of every single user and can identify those like high intent or those users that you want to focus on and deliver very personalized messages to them. Yeah, it makes sense. And, and that's a, um, I mean, two incredibly challenging industries to, um, to kind of navigate, right? I mean, yep. we know that all that data comes from so many different sources and, and certainly um, personalization, personalization is kind of absolute key there because you, you, um, it's a process, right? Either of those is. is selecting insurance or, or, you know, home loans or, or insurance, whatever it may be. It's, it's a difficult, um, those data sources are, are wildly sensitive to a lot of people as they should be. Um, so yep. e-personalization or marketing on top of that needs to be incredibly uh, sensitive, handled with care, which, which yeah. uh, is kind of fascinating. And it, so, and it goes back to, sorry, uh, it goes back to okay. your kind of one of your first questions is like how do marketers overcome this fine, fine line of messaging, very, very unique, tailored, relevant messages, but also being cautious, being respectful of that user's information. So I will say, I do think it's uh, that, that kind of uh, that testing and optimizing for brands to actually kind of figure out themselves as well. Of course, and it's amazing how many people skip over that, right? Yep. The, the yep. optimization part because they're trying to hit their numbers and get get information out of the door, um, but that is incredibly important. So, so Andrew, yeah. tossing it to you a little bit, um, you know, how does MetaRouter help their clients or their customers really navigate the compliance challenges and and specifically around data? Like, how what does that look like? Yeah. So, um, you know, our and our platform is all about centralizing how this data, when it, you know, um, gets created, how it's ingested and how it's routed properly. So, you know, we take all the third party tags off of your uh, mobile app, off your website, you know, all this data is now centralized into just a regular kind of um, um, schema, you know, a set of functions that your developers can just implement once and then uh, it takes all that control of the data and puts it into an environment where the marketer themselves can have direct control so they can turn on new destinations you know we can take the data stream coming in uh, from the website and syndicate it between data lakes you know for your audience building uh, to blue shift to CRM tools live chat tools um, and you know after uh, by syndicating across all these channels they get a more reliable set of data, right? So, I mean, you're bypassing uh, a lot of the, just the 
<laughs> the restrictions that the browser has put in place around just you know not treating third party uh, uh, co uh, cookies and functionality like uh, first party, um, especially around like identity. Uh, so as this comes through your control plane, you can select what set what part of that data actually goes to all these uh, partners uh, and give everyone the exact information they need in a in a uh, format that is more reliable and more durable. And then that allows for, you know, blue shift to, because they uh, gain information across multiple channels, right? They're getting information from your CRM, from live chat, from uh, these email campaigns, and they can stitch together a more accurate profile. And, and, you know, this is in all addition to having that compliance and making sure that, you know, you're not sending PII to you know, certain analytic tools that just don't need it, um, that, you know, your ad campaigns are really only doing the basic identification needed while also protecting your consumer's identity. Right. So, so just to, to kind of expand on that, there, I would assume there's just risk, right? Whenever data or unneeded data is being sent somewhere, whether it's to a destination or to a third party, or even to maybe a data warehouse internally, mm -hmm. um, there is a level of risk associated with that data being sent there, and uh, you know not throttling it sooner before yeah. it's ever sent. Right? I mean, is that yeah? Kind of it's it's all about uh, you know the the scope. Who has access to what information? You know, um, you have basically the unfettered access that you know these third party snippets that you install into your website to gain the information there. They have full access to that domain, but you know you still have to be cognizant of you know even after you pull them off the site, the stream of data that you're sending them, you also have to ensure that they only have the information that they need because I mean everyone, you know your own organization, organizations that you partner with to drive insights, they all have security risks when it comes to storing the information. So you can minimize those risks as much as possible by ensuring that there's only the specific set of information that's needed in order uh, for them to do to drive those insights to drive that value to uh, your organization uh, and nothing more. Um, and you know when you become the controller of your data, you can also implement ways to ensure that you can have the more you know the the, the more um, sensitive information stored within your own. Uh, hardware within the uh, the environments that you fully control uh, to stitch together some of this information when you're doing audience building um, and you know really have full insight on how that is protected and that it is compliant because it is ultimately you're the organization that's at risk for not uh, meeting that compliance right it's interesting yeah you know if uh, if you don't mind I want to piggyback off of that just a little bit because completely agree with you Andrew um, you definitely want to work with solutions that that has those capabilities the safeguards or, or processes to ensure your customer data is secure and safe right and like for example I know blue shift um, we have we have like a, a functionality called role-based access control that basically allows kind of admins to establish a criteria of what certain users should have access to that data because for example to your point um someone in customer success probably only needs access to maybe hey who's that like what kind of plan that user has uh, what user or how many people are in that user's family whatever it may be whereas someone in marketing or sales probably just needs some basic information so, so to be able to set that specific criteria and kind of limit who has accessibility to data is also a key component for, for that as well. Oop, might be on mute, Dave. I, I, <laughs> so I said the most intriguing thing then and everyone just missed it. So it'll have to be that way. No, I, I was just saying, um, uh, you know, that, that granularity of, of, you know, understanding where your data is being sent from, you know, to and from third parties, to and from, your partners or your integrations and then even down to the role base, you can see how important that is, right? Not, not even from a, you know, if you're in blue shift from a usability standpoint, it makes sense to only see the data that's relevant to you, right? You know, if you're, if you're kind of performing a certain role or function every day, um, it only makes sense for you to see the data that you're actually going to use. And that same sort of logic is actually how meta router thinks about, at least, you know, Murray, correct me if I'm yeah, wrong. Yeah, no, it's... Better router thinks about 
own, you know, third parties or partners only seeing the data that they need to see. Mm -hmm. and that, yeah. it's a simple like even, that. even for us, you know, for our, you know, uh, support contracts and, you know, when we actively manage clusters, we block our own access to actually being able to see the data. We really, you know, yeah. our goal, the thing that I, I feel it sets us, you know, apart from our competition is that we truly try to t treat data as a utility. Uh, every bit of data is first class, every bit of data is sensitive until, you know, the, the client says otherwise. Yep. Yeah, it makes sense. Do you guys see this affecting, we talked about like larger and smaller companies. Do you see it affecting like, you know, enterprise organizations differently? Um, I mean, do they have a leg up? Or are they behind on, on kind of this, this data culture movement, we'll call it, I guess? Yeah, uh, Andrew, maybe I'll take this one first. Sure. Um, so I, to, to your question, yes, with, without a doubt, um, I think regardless of if you're kind of a smaller organization to an enterprise company, everyone has to deal with these policy regulations um, and stay compliant, right? Also, as an end consumer, no one wants to, no one wants to work with a company or give away um, personal information if they are historically not good at handling it and making sure it's safe. Right. Um, I would, I will say like smaller brands there, it like, obviously they have to deal with all of these, these, um, these regulations. Um, and as my, to my point earlier, they, they need to be smart about how they go about it. Right. They are resource constrained. They may not have that in-house expertise. Also keeping data secure and safe. Isn't their core expertise, right? They, may just be a, a healthcare insurance company or consumer finance company, but data security is not their primary kind of core competency. Right. So they definitely need to be smart about how they approach that, evaluate the tools that they already know um, can be compliant and um, really have a good reputation for that. I would say on the, on the large enterprise side, that's, I would say they definitely face a tougher challenge. They do have the resources um, to do it, but they all, they're also in say a variety of different countries. They're moving data around from different solutions. So that can definitely bring in more complexity. Um, so regardless of size, I would say every organization is going to come across this, um, and actually have to kind of figure out how to, uh, deliver really personalized communications while also keeping their data safe, secure, and being under, um, compliancy. Yeah, it's spot on. I mean, as small organizations, it's, you know, any resources that are not pulled are that are pulled away from product are detrimental to the business. And it's, it's not a call that you can just say, let's not worry about, you know, the security and this privacy and these protections for the people that use our, our service. Um, but to really just understand that, you know, it's a better use for you to bring in experts that can get you squared away and much a quicker manner and allow your your you know resources your organizational resources to focus really on what you know they know best and that's you know driving innovation for your own product and like large businesses it's you know it it is tough being a very big ship to move around and be nimble um so you know usually by bringing in an outside party to help kind of gain control and gain the scaffolding that you need to have these protections it's a lot easier but you know there's also I think a, a, a fallacy that can happen with, because like, at least from MetaRouter's viewpoint, centralizing the, all your data stream isn't necessarily a very difficult uh, part of this ecosystem. Where the difficulty comes in is around the ongoing maintenance of it. And it's, you know, ensuring that, you know, Blue Shift, your CRMs, your live chat widgets are getting the information that they need. And then as these systems grow and, you know, they have added complexity or, you know, they need different insights, uh, you have to have a component of your organization uh, working with them uh, all the time to make sure that they're getting exactly the insights they need, you know, as new APIs um, come online and, you know, things change in order to really drive quick, successful insights. Um, it then becomes a, a passion project that you have to either embed within your organization and it takes up additional resources, additional spend, or you find a good qualified partner that can help be that broker for you. Yeah, it makes sense. And, and from my perspective, having experience, uh, quite a bit of experience as kind of a marketing operations role, uh, meaning you know, spinning up new tools and making them functional, not only for marketing, but sales and making sure they're talking to each other and then also 
kind of effectively delivering on our mission to, you know, find prospects and, and all that kind of stuff. I, I kind of see this holistically for medium sized companies, possibly following under kind of that marketing operations person, um, or maybe even a sales operations person. Um, it might be kind of a hybrid thing or be eventually be its own role, right? Where they're, they're, there's a marketing ops person that is really worried about the usability internally of data. And then there's a person that's worried uh, or managing the compliance in the integration and connectivity. Um, like you said, like the scaffolding of that data talking to each other. So the marketing operations role or functions, I think have expanded exponentially uh, in probably the last 10 to 15 years. I'm not even sure if that was around like 15 years ago, but there are obviously so many tools, 9,000 or so tools, uh, marketing specific tools that are out there. Um, and everyone thinks about data and how they handle data differently and what priorities um, you know, they're in the order that data should be sent to them and, and all that kind of stuff too. So um, it's kind of interesting. So um, so for, for those on the call that want to ask some questions, feel free to chat them or, or um, just write anything in, in the chat if you have any questions or want us to touch on something. But I do have kind of one more question, um, you know, for you guys. So where do you see this headed? We've, we've kind of talked about it going from kind of a history of like a no man's land to people becoming more educated about data and how it's handled at organizations they're either buying from or working with. Um, what, what is the future for compliance and privacy focused marketing look like? Um, Calvin, I'll start with you. Yeah, no, another great question. Um, and <laughs> that really resonates with me because I was actually reading an article this morning and it was titled why financial service institutions should think like tech companies. Um, and it's really, really the focus of the article was talking about how these institutions and these organizations need to start leveraging all of their first party data and optimize their digital channels to improve the overall customer experience. Yeah. Um, and these organizations that typically or historically have been say in person, they really need to rethink kind of who they are and redefine themselves. We've seen a huge transition or a huge shift um to the digital marketing landscape especially in these past six months i think everything has sped up quite a bit um, and these organizations are realizing how important it is to take advantage and leverage all of their first party data from these different sources so kind of moving forward i i really start seeing um this big shift where marketers start leveraging all of their first party data to deliver very connected omni-channel experiences that adapt to where every user is in the customer journey. So for example, maybe we'll just say consumer finance, the messages I receive when I'm signing up for my first say credit card should be, uh, will be a little different than say I'm on my second home mortgage and kind of want to get more relevant, personalized, tailored information towards me for that, right? So having having marketers being able to leverage all of their data to deliver the most relevant messages and content at each stage is is going to be i would say the future but also making sure that data is compliant and secure when these marketers have access to it that makes sense and andrew what about you well i mean i, I think it's just a you know continuation of these trends that we're seeing to the nth degree uh, you, you you have you know a big drive for personalization coming from the consumers you know they really engage with brands that can cater to them specifically and then also they're becoming a very uh, uh more educated base around the information that they provide the data that you know uh, comes from them and you you see this kind of growth around the concept that you know the data that uh, you generate is yours it's you know it is an extension of you mm -hmm. um, you know from you know a lot of the just overall privacy wants that are being expressed in products like Firefox and Google and Safari's, you know, added consumer protections that's outside of any regulation steps. And then the regulations, and then, I mean, you, you even see, you know, certain like nations uh, build this identity like Estonia. Uh, it's, it's a very data conscious uh, country that, you know, every citizen, every Estonian citizen uh, data is a right of theirs. The data that they produce is, you know, has 
vast protections around it. Uh, and I think we're just going to keep going that pace because, you know, everyone is going to become more educated around it and they'll want to be able to have the, an ability to provide actions on that data, like what is collected, being able to say, you know, I would rather not get personalized ads on Facebook. Um, I would rather that information not go to that ad engine. I'm okay with analytics. I'm okay with, you know, you know, maybe certain emails, um, but, you know, allow the, the consumer to have a direct voice into what's going on. Yeah, it makes sense. And, and so we are um, just about at time, but we, we got a, about a minute or two late start. So I'll, I'll go just another minute or two. Um, so, you know, unless anyone has any questions, feel free to, to chime in, but I just kind of want to circle everything back up, you know, so, so what do you think, and maybe I'll lead this question because it, for, for me, it's like a little bit of a no brainer. We talked about like kind of creating this culture of compliance at organizations, no matter what size you are, right? Like if you're a marketer and you care about um, the people you're reaching out to, and I always say this, you know, kind of to our team, it's like, we are actually trying to reach out to humans, like human beings, right? On the other side, sometimes I know like social media can be kind of a crazy thing and not to go there, but you know, there's a human on the other side of those messages you send, right? Um, and I kind of think the same way in the way that we approach data and the way that we approach, you know, personalization is we're really trying to just get in front of people that we think might care about what we do, right? So I think a, a simple thing for organizations to really think about is find someone or be that person that cares about compliance. Um, and naturally, personalization will actually become even easier because you're not sending all this data into these personalization tools that isn't going to use it anyway, right? You're, you're not cluttering those databases or those third-party tools that you have um, with irrelevant information that will actually clutter your opportunity to personalize. So, you know, that, that's my takeaway from listening to you guys is um, someone on your team needs to care about this, right? But, um, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting just, just to hear that. We just had a question pop up. Um, so, so if you guys don't mind, I'll, I'll, I'll take that just because I want to try to address it. So, um, Chris, thank you for, for your, your question. He said, we have attempted to do what you're describing in the last two years. We have an internal call center, internal prospect remarketing on email and SMS, internally built tracking platform, third-party CRM, plus about 10 other platforms used to validate data, et cetera. How easy is it to, to implement and maintain your platform? Do I need, need dedicated staff to run your systems? How long does it usually take to onboard? That's kind of a good question for, for both of us a little bit. Yeah. Blue Shift, let's, uh, you know, let's start with you guys. Yeah, um, so there's a, a lot packed into that question. There is. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I'd say implementation, maybe we'll start with that. Um, depending on your, your team size, your resources, making sure everyone's aligned and, and knows what to do, I think that plays a big, big, big role, right? We've seen large enterprises um, get onboarded, implemented, um, and up and running and see a return on investment in little as a few months, right? So it's all, I would say the first step is just making sure, regardless of the team, whether it's like your project manager for this actual project, um, the IT team, your marketing team, they're all aligned and understand their roles and responsibilities. Um, on the blue ship side, we have a dedicated kind of uh, customer success and implementation team that will help you ingest all or help you get kind of up and running and get all of these um, platforms integrated. So to your question, uh, to your to your comment, you mentioned you have a call, an internal call center, prospect remarketing for email and SMS, a tracking platform, your CRM. Uh, for Blue Shift, the more data, the better. We want all of your data to be piped in there, just because that gives your team more more power and more insight to what your customers are actually doing at each stage of the customer lifecycle. Um, so like we've, we've seen companies like you just, like you just mentioned, ingest their call center, ingest their CRM, their website, their mobile application, um, and any other kind of tool they're using, um, whether it's analytics, BI, uh, maybe it's like a e-commerce thing like Shopify. Um, we have native integrations to actually pipe in, uh, both that data and actually push it out to those applications as well. Um, in regards to kind of like the, the dedicated staff, 
So on the blue shift side, we have a, a dedicated team to make sure all your data is being piped in and out correctly, um, securely and safely as well. I would say our typical implementation process will probably take about um, 12 weeks, depending on, on the company size, the resources they have, and obviously time and time and stuff like that. So And the data quality and, and all that. Yes, and the data quality. So yeah. actually a good thing to note too about the BlueShift platform is we can ingest data regardless of kind of the size, volume, and structure. If it's unstructured, semi-structured, um, or, or structured, right? All that data can be piped into BlueShift. So it's, it's, we can't ingest that like um, fa fairly simply as well. Awesome. Good. You, you nailed every one of those, I think, yeah. So hopefully there that's we go. <laughs> uh, Andrew, what about, what about the meta router side? Yeah, so um, the platform itself is pretty easy to stand up. You know, we, we kind of, um, we leverage Kubernetes. So Kubernetes is a requirement of ours for a platform to install into. And this is installing into, again, an environment that you fully control. You know, this is Kubernetes on a cloud provider, uh, GCP, AWS, Azure. Um, you know, this can be even on-prem Kubernetes. Uh, you know, we're working on supporting um, OpenShift right now, uh, IBM Red Hat. Um, so once that Kubernetes um, environment is up and running, you know, our engineers install it within a day or two. Um, and then I would say comes the probably the, the, the biggest uh, part of setting up the platform is getting all your applications ready to route data to it. We, we leverage the, the open source analytics JS specification for all incoming data. Um, so, you know, there's SDKs for, you know, um, basically all languages that you would write consumer applications in uh, that you would implement, have your team implement. You know, usually this is kind of, this corresponds with uh, an opportunity for you to clean up your, you know, what events you do want to track, you know, what is significant within your pipeline, within your user funnel. Um, but as soon as all that information is going to the, you know, HTTP API, or, you know, um, we do have, because this is a private uh, platform, uh, if this is all coming from other private systems, it can be fully walled off and not have any uh, open access to the internet um, uh, for incoming data. Uh, so as soon as uh, you have your applications routing data to it, um, then uh, it's merely just kind of uh, picking and choosing the pipelines, the destinations that you want to support. Uh, Meta Router provides, you know, default mappings uh, to uh, all the destinations that we support. Uh, and then you also have the ability to customize those mappings. So if you, know, you have some data that's coming into, let's say user properties that you wanna make sure that are being represented uh, properly when you send to uh, BlueShift a map to certain IDs, you know, we allow for the mapping of that information. You can do things as you know, drop maybe PII uh, from going to like data lakes. Uh, and uh, you can even hash information. So let's say you, you want you know, IDs to be sent to marketers uh, marketing platforms um, and be able to cross-link that with the uh, audience profiles that you're building off of your data lake or data warehouse, you can hash the ID going to marketers um, and then be able to do a one-to-one -one comparison off of their reports to your own internal information without necessarily giving them the details of that personally identifiable information. Um, so I guess this is a very long winded to say, uh, a thing to say it's, it's variable. Um, but, you know, we've seen our, our, the organizations that we help uh, set up, you know, we've seen full implementation in a period of, you know, uh, four, six, eight weeks. Um, now, it's, it is aggressive time cycle. And, you know, if you have a lot of, you know, individual applications, you know, that have their own, you know, engineering teams, it will have to sync up with their work. But after that very first implementation, then everything else is controlled from that one centralized plane. And it's very easy to add on new destinations, turn off old destinations, edit any of that information that's being processed. Yeah, and I'll say to, to piggyback off that again, on the BlueShift side, once that data is being piped in from MetaRouter, on BlueShift, it's very flexible in the sense of marketers can become self-sufficient and have that ability to, to track any of the events that they want from those different data sources. Um, so yeah. I did yeah. forget uh, for when it comes to dedicated staff to runner systems, um, you know, we usually kind of ask for 
uh, well, you'll need a marketer that kind of manages the configurations that understands, you know, the information that these destinations would need. Uh, typically, we also recommend some uh, engineer to stand in as an SRE to make sure that the Kubernetes um, uh, cluster that you have has the resources that's needed to withstand the ebb and flow of uh, data coming in, um, you know, just based off of the organic uh, rate, the data, uh, the rate of data coming in from your applications. Um, you know, a meta router does also provide, um, you know, uh, services to help manage that platform for you. Uh, we even, uh, for a few clients, we uh, actually run their platform in a fully private cloud environment that's solely theirs, that's solely only used for their information, completely segmented from any other client. Uh, and, uh, you know, we manage that fully for them, so they only have to worry about configuring the pipelines. Uh, some use it as, you know, a stepping stone to finally get, you know, their own internal teams kind of um, updated with, you know, the Kubernetes information and, you know, the, the information they need to run it successfully. And others, you know, uh, use it as an option to kind of just keep it with a kind of this past solution so that way their own internal IT teams uh, can be more focused on managing the system critical information for their application. Yep. That makes sense. Um, well, Chris, thank you again for the question. That was actually um, kind of a good layup for a little bit more about what we do. Um, so thank you. I appreciate that and, and appreciate you guys answering. So we are officially 10 minutes over, but that's the way I, I like to roll. So there we go. Um, you know, time flies when you're having fun. But um, I would like to thank everyone, of course, Calvin and Andrew, thank you guys so much. This is a great conversation. I'm really glad we did this. I, I, I love this format. No PowerPoints. Maybe, I don't know, maybe people like PowerPoints, but I like, I like just engaging conversation. Um, so I, I appreciate everyone joining us. Again, there will be a recording um, that we will have, hopefully get out the door tomorrow morning, if not sooner. So make sure you keep an eye out on that if you guys want to share this or, or just listen uh, kind of as a podcast style without our faces. We're happy to do that too. So um, again, thank you everyone for joining. Uh, Blue Shift crew, thank you so much. We look forward to working with you guys more. And, and Andrew, uh, thank you so much. Can we see what's behind the door, Be behind the painting? Uh, you have to wait for the next webinar. All right. Good. good. There we out. go. <laughs> All right. Thank you guys. I appreciate you. Thanks guys. Take care. Thank you. Bye.